Hi, this is Andrew Leland, author of The Country of the Blind, a memoir at the end of sight, and you're listening to White Canes Connect. Hey there, PA Federationists. Welcome to another episode of White Canes Connect, presented by the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania. My name is David Goldstein. I am the treasurer of the Keystone Chapter and the Pennsylvania Association of Blind Merchants. Joining me today is co-host and White Canes Connect creator, Lisa Bryant. Lisa, what do we have on tap today? Today, we have a very um, exciting guest. Andrew Leland has written a book or memoir titled The Country of the Blind, A Memoir at the End of Sight. It is a fascinating read of his journey of vision loss, which is continuing. But what's also interesting, there's so much history in here about blindness, about the arts in blindness, about the NFB, about the ACB. It's it's really rich with a lot more than just his story, but he weaves it in all together very beautifully. Yeah, it really was a great read. And he also talks about technology. The one thing that stood out to me, and I listened to the audiobook like you, and it was kind of funny why I listened to the audiobook because I tried to listen on Bookshare and I just couldn't keep it going while I shut the screen down. I know I'm doing something wrong there, but I listened to the audiobook version, which he narrates. It was almost like listening to a podcast, a very long podcast, yeah. but just the way he tells the story, it is just outstanding. It got me so interested in reading again. That I, I've already started to line up some other books that I'm going to check out that other people have talked to me about. But this is a great read. And again, it is available on Bookshare. It is available on Bard. And of course, you can go to Amazon and get the large print edition, or you can get the audiobook version from either Amazon or as I did, Apple Books. But let's take a listen to Andrew Leland and his story. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Andrew, it's really, really nice to speak with you. I wonder if you've caught your breath. I mean, <laughs> I was looking at your your publicity tour. Um, pretty impressive. Um, I wonder, did you expect to see so much interest from the mainstream media? Um, I mean, I have been in publishing long enough and have seen enough books come out where you know, people work really hard for years and then there is crickets. So I'm just yeah. super grateful. You know, I think you, you always hope that that people will respond to it. But, you know, it's also it's a mainstream publisher. So there was always, mm -hmm. I think, the expectation that this book wasn't just for blind people and that other people would would respond to it. But yeah, I had no uh, it has definitely exceeded my expectations, the response. Well, congratulations, because the reviews have been Absolutely stellar. And just as a little anecdote, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, oh, great. And, yeah. And David and I are also in a local um, blind uh, and visually impaired meetup group. Some folks in that group have read it. And I mm. think one of them has been in correspondence with you via email. Oh. And uh, very impressive, very impressed, I should say. One woman said she just learned so much about mm. just the history of blindness organizations that we will definitely get into. Cool, um, yeah. But I guess first tell us, in fact, oh yeah, one more little tidbit. I also heard about this from a sighted friend who is on Goodreads. So, Oh, wow, nice. You're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you're Thank everywhere. You. you know, it's funny, there was like a moment where uh, before the book came out, you know, because uh -huh. I use Bookshare and Bard and I was like, what if like everybody reads the book, but they all read it on Bookshare and Bard? And then my publisher is like, <laughs> you're in big trouble. Uh, right. <laughs> but hopefully enough, you know, enough aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters are also reading it that it'll it'll come out in the wash. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about the title, first mm. of all. What's the story behind the title? Yeah. Uh, when I was researching blindness, I, I actually taught a class um, called The Literature of Blindness a couple of years before I even mm. thought about writing a book. And that class, you know, we read, um, you know, Oedipus, Rex, and we read 
Borges and we read like all you know novels. We read Jose Saramago's Blindness. Basically, like I just tried to figure out interesting books about blindness. And one of the things we read was this H.G. Wells short story called The Country of the Blind. That is, you know, H.G. Wells wrote The Time Machine and War of the Worlds, like an early sci-fi writer. Um, and, and this was a story that was actually the name of a collection of stories that you can find on Bard or Bookshare. And it's great. And, and it's interesting. It's, it's, it's this story of a, of an explorer named Nunez who is, you know, on an expedition in the Andes mountains and there's a rock slide and he gets separated from his expedition crew. And then he finds himself in this like lost world, this lost valley, um, where people have lived without sight for generations. And it's it's a it's really a, a civilization. I mean, it's a small civilization. It's really just like a city, but it's built for blind people, by blind people. Their, their language has no word for sight. And it's this idea of like mm. a, a se- almost like a separatist blind utopia. And and he comes into it with this really colonial attitude, like, oh, well, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. I'm just gonna like dominate these people. And and very quickly he realizes that it's the other way around and that he is actually in a way, you know, Wells doesn't put it, you know, they didn't have the language around disability, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, the way we do now, but really like he realizes he's the disabled one as, as this person with sight in a, in a world built for blindness, you know, and so it's this kind of brilliant inversion, but the reason why I, I borrowed Wells's title, you know, and, and to be clear, like, you know, Wells borrowed the title from that proverb the, in the land of the blind. Um, but, but for me, it was, it was this idea of, I felt a little bit like Nunez, um, Yes. In that I was sort of by, you know, accident of nature being pulled into this new world that felt very exotic to me, you know, and I was this like, you know, quote unquote, normal sighted uh, explorer just in my life. And now suddenly, like, because of retinitis pigmentosa and the gradual vision loss that I was experiencing, like I was, I was in this world. And just like, just like in the story, there's this sense of like, being an adventurer and being like, well, where am I? And who are these people? And mm. what, how did they live? And, and so the book really, I wanted it to have that feeling of not just like a personal narrative, but also like an an adventure and an exploration of of a of an unfamiliar land. So this is a memoir. I actually I came up with the phrase as I was thinking about our talk. It's a memoir with a couple of bonus tracks because mm. there's history there, there's education there for people outside of the community about you know, our tools and mm. devices and, and just the language, as you said earlier about blindness. So there's so much more, but in short, country, the country of the blind is your journey, um, your continued journey, I should yeah. say, um, of losing vision. And how, tell us, how long of a period are we talking about? How long did you, um, are you covering in the book? Oh, I mean, well, in terms of my own personal journey that's um, ongoing right? yeah i kind of fast forward through the first uh decade or two of my life because there's not a lot going on there that's related to blindness and it really starts when i first notice something is going on with my eyes which is um early teens right. and and you know i think it's a pretty classic rp story um i'm out out with my friends trying to like you know walk around in people's, you know, in the hills. It was, I was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the time. So there was a lot of like hillsides with like, you know, rocky, sandy, you know, pinon trees. And I was just noticing my friends were so good at just like picking their way up the the, the dark night path. And I'm like walking into trees and tripping over stones and same thing in movie theaters, you know, like why is everybody else so comfortable, like picking their way through the, through the crowd um, once the lights have gone down. And um yeah, so that that's where it starts, and then, and then really like the memoir part of it, I do fast forward pretty quickly through, you know, the next twenty years after that, and 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 the book. I love your idea of the bonus tracks because like <laughs> the, the 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 even though it, it is a memoir, like a lot of the things that I'm writing about in terms of my experience are very recent and like things that I kind of was experiencing while writing the book, which is to say like going to my first NFB convention and going right. to the Colorado Center of the Blind and like even in a way, even though it's like not really a memoir, like reading history, you know, and like like mm-hmm. le- using my cane for the first time. And like, so a lot of those things are happening in like the last five years. And so it's not a memoir in the traditional sense of like, I was born here and like, here's my right. high school years. Like it right. really <laughs> zooms through a lot of that to bring us into like, what, how do you figure out how to go blind or how to be blind really? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's actually 
kind of helps me ask this next question. What did you set out to do? What was your your goal? I was pretty excited in a way at the at the sense that you know, cuz I think any any nonfiction book that I would want to read would do what I did with those bonus tracks, like you said, where I I didn't want it to just be uh, a memoir. I wanted to include all of this history and and sort of like arguments and ideas. But the challenge was like how to make that feel connected to the memoir stuff. And I felt like I had a really big advantage in a way because it wasn't just like, okay, well, now my publisher says I should talk about the history of Braille. It really felt like there was a natural connection between like, crap, I'm a writer, I'm losing print. Like, what, what do I, how do I figure that out? And what are, what's available to me? And so then there's like a very organic motivation to be like, well, let's figure out like, is Braille the way to go? Like, where did Braille come from? And like, these are all like really genuine questions that I had. So, so to answer your question, like, like what I set out to do was tell a little bit of the story of what it's, what that's been like losing vision gradually, but then Mm -hmm. also like explain the world of blindness to myself in a way that would be interesting to anybody, whether they're somebody who's like been deep in the organized blind movement for their whole lives, or like, who's just like a random person at airport grabbing a book because it looks interesting and like how to talk to both of those audiences and to myself in a way that would really say something new and and to give something of value. I listened to it through Mm. Audible and you narrate it. Mm Mm-hmm. Which I was I was really psyched about because that to me just makes it feel more intimate. You feel like you're really in the story. I wonder, first of all, that's another sort of inspiration mm. within the story that you losing your vision are also narrating this book. What was that like? And did you did you insist on that? Was that something that was important for you to actually narrate your own story? And then what did you use? What were your tools? What was your yeah. preferred mode of uh, your preferred mode of reading transportation? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, it did feel really important to me to narrate it um, in part because I just I have experience, you know, doing podcasts and, and radio stuff. Like I just felt like I, I knew how to do it and I would be good at it. But also, yeah, it's such a personal story. It would feel strange to have somebody else, somebody else's yeah. voice. I write about this a lot in the book of just like the feeling of fraudulence, like, you know, like busting out my cane, but then Mm -hmm. looking at my phone visually, you know, and like, I felt that pretty acutely going into the recording studio, because I'm like, here I am, like talking a big game about being a blind guy, but I'm like reading this book visually, that's Mm -hmm. messed up. And then it was really this funny experience, because like, I started to read the book aloud. And I was like, Oh, look at this, I've like written this book length letter to myself. That's just like, if anything, it is like a reassurance that Actually, no, like you can be blind and still be like a low vision guy who can like read large print and do it. And it was, it was like, I almost was like consoling myself as I read the book aloud in this funny way. But, um, but yeah, so to answer your question more specifically, kind of coincidentally, I found out about this typeface that was produced by the, or this font that was produced by the Braille Institute in LA, Mm. um, that was specifically designed for low vision readers. And they just like thought really carefully about making every letter, like, you know, there's like common letters that get confused for each yeah. other when you, when you have low vision. And so I was like, Oh, I'm going to use that. And I like blew it up super big. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was funny because I actually had to like OCR my own book because at that point, like the only version of it I had was like a PDF that, um, wasn't going to be easy accessible. for me to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, Hmm. Uh, so I just used Kurzweil, uh, and I OCR'd my own book, and then I like refloated into this this typeface called Atkinson Hyper Legible from the Braille Institute, which is free download for anybody interested. And then I like blew it up super big, and I had to like scroll constantly in order to, you know, like I'd really only see like half a sentence at a time on my screen. Mm-hmm. But I was like, that's mm-hmm. fine if I'm just scrolling constantly, it'll be no problem. And then I got into the recording studio, and they were like after like 30 seconds, they were like, we can hear you scrolling. Like we're picking up the scrolling. So you have to just pause. You can't be speaking and scrolling at the same time. And I was like, oh no, we're doomed because yeah. it's going <laughs> to sound so edits, chopped right? up. Yeah. But then they were like, no, no, no. Like we're professionals. <laughs> uh, just do it. And it will we'll cut out the pauses. So I had to be like, you know, I'm going blind as I write this scroll, scroll, <laughs> scroll. It's not as dramatic as it sounds. Scroll, scroll. And lo and behold, like they cut out all those pauses mm. and that sounds fine. So that was, but it was, it was a little harrowing at first. What size font did you use uh, for that? Um, 
I think it was like maybe 24 or 26 point. And then, but that's also like, then I like zoom in Okay. on top of yeah. that. So functionally, we're probably talking like 40 or 50, I would guess. Okay. 30, 30 or 40. I don't know. That's as, as my vision, what I have left of it goes, I, I heard an interview once, uh, with someone who said, you know, when I got to 72 point font, I figured it was time that I learned how to read Braille or yeah. use some other use a screen reader or something like that. And and I'm yeah. getting to that point because every time I make something up, I'm making the font bigger and also zooming in. Yeah, I've gotten that advice. I, well, the advice that I've gotten is like, don't wait until you mm-hmm. you need you're like, OK, it's time to stop doing magnification. I'm going to switch to a screen mm-hmm. reader because, you know, I mean, I think that's the whole argument behind Fusion, right? Where it's like mm-hmm. you've got Zoom text going and JAWS. So you're like getting used to JAWS. And then when you make that transition to like just doing JAWS, it's not as jarring as it would be if you were starting from scratch. And that's definitely the approach I've taken. So I'm like, well, you know, writing the book. Well, I actually became a screen reader user, like a, a sort of dedicated all day, every day screen reader user only like halfway through writing the book. Um, but, but like by that point I had sort of been like boy scout style, like forcing myself to practice <laughs> in the background. And it was, I was so glad because if I hadn't been doing that practice, I would have been in a much worse place trying to finish the book as my, my vision got weaker. You've been very proactive in learning alternative means, mm. um, so that you don't have to, I guess, get shocked, um, yeah. you know, as vi- vision diminishes more and more. I remember one part of the book where you described this as going blind over and over Mm. again. Do you still feel like you're in that part of the journey? I really do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do and I don't, I guess. Like, I've kind of hit a philosophical point that I can't always, like, if I'm being honest with you, it's like there's good days and there's bad days, you know, but on the good days, I think philosophically, I've hit a point where I'm like, learning braille using a screen reader you know using my cane wherever i go and like i'm still using my vision inevitably but like i'm really proactively trying to like do things non visually yeah. so that then and when i'm when i'm being good like that and i'm like on a roll with it my i'll notice like my vision will change and it won't mess me up at all like i won't get yeah. sort of stressed out about it i won't get depressed it's just sort of like whatever like right i, I don't need it uh And, but that, that's like, I'm talking a big game. If I, you know, I'd be lying if I said I'm always like that, you know, and there's definitely Mm -hmm. times when like my vision changes even a little bit and I'm like, you know, get thrown for a loop by it Mm -hmm. and get bummed out and have to sort of metabolize that. So this journey took you to a lot of different places and spaces and David and I were both uh, very, so I I guess shocked would be surprised. Maybe I'll say surprised (laughs) uh, to hear of some of the, NFB history. Mm. Um, you went to, I think, a couple of NFB conventions. Am I am I right about that? Yeah, only one in person because then it went virtual. Uh, right. I missed. Yeah, I went to 2018, and then I m- missed 2019, and then it was. Um, then I went to the virtual ones after that. As you were researching it, and not only just researching, I get the sense that it's a twofold mission. You were researching for the memoir or for the book, but also for your own personal growth and development. Um, but you learned some things, and we, like I said, David and I learned some things mm. that we didn't know. So thank mm. you for that education of the <laughs> history, um, some of the history of the NFB. Talk about um, the two most, uh, I guess, the bit largest organizations, the National Federation of the Blind and the American Council hmm. of the Blind. Can you sh- share briefly, because I want people to read this, so just a yeah. little teaser about what you talk about, um, about this, how one organization was birthed out of the yeah. other. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the NFB in 1940, when it's founded, is really the birth of the organized blind movement in the United States. Right. And 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 what that means is before that, you know, that you have like little pockets like it was there were there were there were there were these sort of smaller organizations that were run by blind people for blind people. Um but there was no national organization that um was was blind led. And you know and 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 as today then you had these these groups that were really pushing back hard against um against this new kind of federal you know program you know so if it's 1940 you know if you think back to like the great depression and then all these like new government assistance programs that came out of the new mm-hmm. deal for the first time you have 
a, a U.S. government that is um, offering, you know, um, um, basically uh, not accommodations, but um, like subsidies, uh, benefits mm-hmm. to blind people, and 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 there was a really strong sense of the kind of paternalism and custodialism even then in those in the way that they were administered. So like Jacobus Tenbrook, who was the the, the founder of the NFB, the first president, um, you know, talked about like the dastardliness of of social workers. And just so so that's that's the sort of birth of, you know, and before that you have like the American Foundation of the Blind has been around much longer, but that was and there were blind people. Robert Irwin was a blind leader in the AFB, but that was always a um an organization that had was was dominated by sighted people and was like more of a research group. It wasn't, and it did advocacy, but but the NFB was really the first time that you have this like self-described radical militant group of blind people who are saying like, we're, we're fed up with the sort of, you know, second class treatment and being treated in this way. Um, and they, 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 ruffle a lot of feathers, you know, uh, and they, 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 it's a really important moment uh, over time. There's a group of increasingly, um, dissatisfied and sort of frustrated um, people in the in in the NFB, and it kind of comes to a head in the '60s, where you know, and there's different tracks of it. There's sort of like philosophical differences around like mm-hmm. what sorts of things the NFB should be doing. There's also like a whole sub narrative that I that I really frankly didn't get into in the book about how like the finances of the organization are run, and there's sort of accusations of financial mismanagement on the part of the NFB, and there's uh, you know fundamentally. It comes as a surprise to no one to say it's like comes down to a power struggle, right? And there's like these accusations of um, it being a really top he- top down, Too top heavy, yeah, yeah. And like you know, and the NFB was explicitly modeled on the organized labor movement, which which Jacobus Tenbrook was was very clear about saying, you know, like we they they draw a parallel. And if you look at labor, it's a similar thing, right? Like there's a sort of rank and file membership that have voting power, but ultimately, like there's these very unilateral decisions that can come down from the leaders. Um, and long story short, this group of NFBers, um, you know, there's this long, you know, you can read all this stuff in the, in the mm-hmm. sort of two institutional histories. There's a really good book, um, by, uh, Floyd Matson called, what's it called? Marching, uh, walking alone, marching together. Do I have that right? Yes. Um, yes. and then there's the ACB one, which is people of vision. I think it's called, I should know this. Okay. Um, but you can find them. <laughs> like if you just search ACB history and NFP history, and they're both massive and they're really valuable mm-hmm. books. I would say both of them are really interesting. Um, and they also, by the way, both start with like, um, sort of pre histories of the, or of the blindness movement. So like, you know, you go back all the way to like ancient Greece and like, you know, like blind guilds in China and there's really interesting stuff. I'd recommend both of those books. Um, but yeah, long story short, at a convention, I think in Houston in the 60s, this mm-hmm. group of dissatisfied NFBers stands up in the middle of the convention, marches across the street to a different hotel and says, okay, we hereby found the American Council of the Blind. And then after that, you know, there's this period of really intense division and resentment that I think has cooled a lot today. I don't think, you know, there's like people of a certain age who like you mentioned uh, ACB to that that type of mm-hmm. NFB year and their eyes, you know, like blaze with with fury yeah. and they're like no way. <laughs> Daggers. You know, the same thing on the other side. But but you know, I think there's a lot of younger folks who are like, well, that's ancient history. Like we're more interested in in you know fighting this fight yeah. together. But the other sort of thing that we were both surprised about was where the two agencies were on things that we really used today and are very grateful for mm. in particular audio description. Yeah. Um just talk a little bit about that sort of kerfuffle that happened between the two over yeah. audio description. Yeah. I mean so I think the NFB's position was um you know so basically the the ACB has always been very active on media access is like the nerdy way to say it, you know, but like stuff yeah. about audio description and um and you know, like pushing pushing that for to 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 be sort of on par with closed captioning as like a federally mandated thing that like all TV networks have to do. And at first, the NFB came out not only against it, but like actually signed on. Um, you know, the, the uh, basically like the the Motion Picture Association of America um, filed a brief, and then I'm forgetting the um, all the legal terminology, but basically the NFB like wrote a. I'm forgetting the name of this legal instrument, but basically they like wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, they signed the petition and like wrote their own thing of like, yeah, this is why this is a really bad idea for 
for audio description to be mandated. And the argument was, was as far as I understand it, that the most important thing was like the emergency alerts and that like this to focus on entertainment was to like miss the boat. And, and, and like, you know, there was this letter that I quote actually from um, Chris Danielson, who's like the um, current NFB uh, uh, press officer. Uh, and he wrote this really kind of passionate piece in the braille monitor that I really admired. I mean, I think Chris is brilliant. Um, but he was basically like, look, like braille literacy is at a low, like unemployment level is high. Like, why are we talking about entertainment access? Like we should, there's mm. much bigger fish to fry, which, yeah. which, you know, I, I don't, I tried not to pass judgment on it too much in the book, like taking a more journalistic objective view. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, my feeling about it now is like, that may be true. Like, you know, it may be more important. Certainly it's more important to like raise the the braille literacy rate and the employment rate than it is to like make sure we can watch old episodes of Matlock with audio description. <laughs> but there's also a sense that like those don't have to be mutually exclusive, you know, and you don't have to like yeah. fight against audio description. Uh, you know, all boats, a rising tide lifts all boats. And and there's also a sense of just like broader inclusion. And my feeling is like you can do both at the same time, I guess. We're always so and I don't know if this is a thing of our culture lately. It's mm. always been there. It's just come to a head. But there's, it seems to always be an either or mm. and not so much the and. Yes. Um, and we can do, we can walk and chew gum. Oh, sometimes I can't, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, and to be fair too, like the NFB has since totally recanted. And, and you know, and like, I felt, I didn't feel bad, but, you know, I, I tried to be clear in the book that like, you know, talking about a lot of these positions that the NFB took that has since come around on, like just being clear, like this is the NFB yeah. of 1990 or whatever, the right. NFB of 1960. Um, right. You know, I'm also clear about, you know, problems in the NFB in 2020. Um, but but it is a it is an organization that has evolved and is evolving. And I tried to make that really clear. And, and I, ho- I hope anybody who reads the book, and I got a really nice email from President Riccobono, like, oh, you know, good. I don't think anybody reading this book thinks that it's like a hit job on the NFB. I know your wife is cited. Mm. I have a cited wife. When you watch TV, audio description or no? It's interesting. I'm I'm very much in that kind of in-between space that we were talking about, where like okay. there are some shows where I don't feel like I need it. And, you know, and I've heard this from people who are totally blind. Like there are some shows where you kind of just don't need it, period. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just getting to the point where like, I wish I had it. And um, and again, if I'm being totally honest with you, I find myself using audio description way more frequently when I'm watching by myself than with her. And I still feel, you know, it's like, this is sort of embarrassing to admit, but like I'm sitting here at my desk and um, and like when I have my window open and I'm using my screen reader, I get self-conscious and I like close the window and it's like, or I put on headphones. It's like, why, who, what do I care if my neighbor hears <laughs> Jaws babbling? Yeah. But right. like, there is still something where it's like, I, these tools are incredible and I love them. And I will like write a thousand words on Facebook about how great they are. But like, I don't really want my neighbor to hear audio, <laughs> uh, my jaws. And I don't really want Lily to have to like, listen to the, you know, red letters appear on a screen, Netflix, you know, like, I'm just like, eh. that was the question. So when you're watching with your wife yeah. and I, I always, uh, I was watching TV the other day and a friend of mine called and I said, Oh, my audio description fell asleep. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and that's when I watch by myself, I obviously use audio description Yeah. when I don't, when, you know, I, I rely on my wife and, and yeah. God forbid she's not paying attention <laughs> to right. something. And then you know, what just happened there? Well, it's also uh, like work. Like for me these days, mostly it's like, and this is just like a thing on shows so much where there's just like, somebody's like having a 10 minute text message conversation and you're just supposed to like read all the text messages and right. I like can't read any of them. So, but I'm like, am I really going to make Lily read all of them? So it's almost like, you know, how some people will just turn the screen reader on like for a long document, but like for shorter stuff, they won't. Like, I feel like right. maybe I should use audio description that way where it's like, oh wait, they're texting each other, but I don't want to be constantly turning it on or off. So yeah, it's a little bit of a, of a moving target for me. When you were talking about, uh, I can so relate to your self impulse. It's a self-imposed embarrassment. Yeah. Um, but it reminded me, and I was actually trying to find this quote because I thought it was so beautifully um, put, but it reminded me of what you said about, um, well, first, there are two phrases. There was one uh, where you talk about our society in general, all of us and our dis- discomfort with disability. Mm, mm-hmm. But there was another beautiful quote that I cannot find right now. So you correct me because I'm okay. going to butcher it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was something to the effect of, I am not necessarily interested in embracing or pers- or pursuing. Mm, 
mm-hmm. disability. Do you remember the? What I I'm do. Talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. So did yeah. I overly? Did I? Did I totally botch that up? No, 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 no. That's exactly right. I mean, yeah. There's a. I was reading this book by. Um, I think her name is Allison Kafer. I think it's called. It's like feminist crip queer. Uh, I think is the name of the book, and it's like a lot about questions that I think about in my book, which is sort of like kind of like intersectionality, like how mm-hmm. does my identity as a man versus my identity as a disabled person, um, you know, versus my identity as like a Jewish guy, whatever, like how do all those things different? How are like, what is identity and how do they, how does it all fit together? You know, and mm-hmm. she makes this point that I kind of piggyback on, which is like, you know, it's one, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit different to say, you know, it's one thing to be like, I'm a woman and I'm really proud of being a woman. Uh, but like to say like, I'm a blind person and I'm really proud of being blind. Like the point that she's making is like, she's, she's a wheelchair user. Um, you know, but she's like, I, there's a tremendous amount of power that she gets from being in a disabled community, finding disability. And she has disability pride, but she's like, that being said, I don't want to become more disabled. Right. And that's an, that's, that's, that's kind of a brain teaser for me, you know? Cause it's like, if you think about pride and identity, like why wouldn't you want to go all in on that identity? But there are definitely aspects of blindness that even though I feel pride and I feel uh, at peace with them, it's like, do I really want to become more blind or do I want to get a second disability in there? Like, no, not necessarily. It really is a, a straddling of sorts because <laughs> you're in um, the world of the sighted as well as the, the, the world of the blind. And David knows it's, I like to Re re quote what someone said about me is that when I'm with my sighted friends, I'm the blind person. With the, when I'm with my blind friends, I'm the sighted person. <laughs> totally, uh, I very much feel that. Yeah, that's exactly my life too. Talk about your other work, Andrew, because we kind of talked around the fact that you were already a very successful writer. I think what is the the um outlet you're at the believer is that where you yeah, are yeah yeah i've been an editor at, at that magazine for a long time uh, it's like an arts yeah. and culture magazine that does essays and interviews with writers and musicians and philosophers and artists um yeah i've been doing that for like since like 2003 um and then i also produced a podcast called the organist that is came out of the believer so it's a similar kind of scope but like really creative fun audio podcast mm-hmm. uh that mm-hmm. sort of like some storytelling, some interviews and some stuff kind of in between. Uh, yeah. So I've been doing work in that kind of like arts journalism space for a long time. And it's really like, like the last five or 10 years that I've become more blind that I started to write about disability more and blindness in particular. But I did, I did a story for the New Yorker about deaf blind communication, this language called pro tactile that's emerging in deaf blind communities and um, I did a story for the podcast Radio Lab. That's like an NPR science podcast about um, disabled astronauts and this this project mm. that these people are doing about like if more people are going to space, like what about disabled people? You know, and stories like that are really fun. And so I'm trying to do more stuff, not just about like my own experience of blindness or even right. about blindness, but like other disabilities and thinking about all these interesting intersections between disability and culture. How do you think your work, if at all, will change? Um, should there be a sudden because I, I I remember reading that you kind of got some bum steers. You thought that this was going to happen much sooner. And then you found out, well, no, this could be like another 20 years or so. And it's, yeah. it's still not necessarily progressed very rapidly right, or right. dramatically, I should say. Yeah. Um, but should that change? Mm. Uh, how are you prepared to continue doing what you're doing now? Or w- will there be any change? Will you have to change uh, anything? Oh yeah, I mean, I I can't tell you that it wouldn't be a change. You know, I mean, like I've just talked to enough blind people who have, who have gone through some version of the like slow degeneration, where right. like when when you can like see the tops of buildings, like my friend Leona Godin, who wrote a, a really great book called Their Plant Eyes, that's sort of like a similar book to mine in some ways. Um, you know, I remember her telling me like, yeah, when I could like, she lives in New York city and she's like, yeah, when I couldn't see like the tops of buildings to like orient around, you know, where to turn right, like, you know, O&M just became an entirely different kettle of fish. And right. I know that that's the case. And so, you know, the best I can do is the kind of Colorado center approach, which is like, do the sleep shade training, like get the non-visual skills. You know, I'm like practicing braille every night. I'm like mm-hmm. trying to use my ears instead of my eyes when I'm crossing mm-hmm. streets and um and then when when the when the next change happens like I know that there's going to be adjustment and grief but I also know that like I'm not starting from scratch and 
you know, I've been thinking a lot recently about this question. And like, there was a, um, there's a New Yorker writer from the sixties and seventies named Ved Mehta, who was totally blind. Um, Mm -hmm. and he wrote, like he had a career as a New Yorker staff writer for decades. And, you know, he often had an an assistant who would come with him and like people would lose their minds because he would read his stories and he would be like, you know, Lisa Bryant, like her eyes twinkled as she smiled (laughs) and like she wore, you know, a red scarf and a red sweater. And people were like, dude is blind. Like, how does he know that? (laughs) And, you know, the reality is like he had his assistant with him and he was doing all the interviews. He was doing all the writing and the reporting and the researching. But like Mm -hmm. the person who was with him was like, she's got a red sweater on and she was smiling when she said that, you know, and like, then he gets to do that. But for me that I, yeah, so I kind of get excited and, you know, and who knows, like in the age of, of the be my eyes, like virtual volunteer, you know, I can imagine like, in 10 years being on a reporting trip wearing like Apple Vision Pro goggles that have like the virtual volunteer version six like fired up on them and I don't need any assistance, you know? One thing you were talking about in the book, how fast you were typing and you were typing ahead of actually hearing the words yeah. as you were going. And and I found that and I, I don't type quite as fast as I used to. Hmm. Uh, how do you get around that? You know, I still have magnification going while I listen. So that was like an experiment. That was like a sleep shades training kind of moment where I like couldn't see the screen. And I was really just like my, and also I'd never really used a screen reader before. So that's really just like dipping your toe into the pool for the first time. These days as I write, um, I don't always write that fast. And, uh, you know, and I'm also just constantly hitting the up arrow and like rereading, you know, and then I do Mm -hmm. up arrow and then, then the insert down key. Right. And I'm just like, (laughs) I mean, you know, and and it's like the same as I wrote when I wrote purely visually, right? Like writers are constantly writing a sentence, rereading it, cutting it, rereading it. You just like, it's just, you're going back over and over again. So that's in some ways, that's like the same process. And it doesn't really matter if I can't hear it while I'm typing it. Cause it's just like, but also I can see it on the screen. And the thing that I really should start doing in terms of like getting my braille up and just like, if I want to be like full boy scout for the future, <laughs> is I need to get a braille display hooked up to JAWS while I'm writing. So even though I can see it to also be feeling it, just like to get into that mm-hmm. happening, I think that would be useful, but it's a little bit like, am I really going to do that? Like if I'm right. trying to be efficient, you know, and it's like, the, it's always the question of like, how efficient do I want to be in the future versus how efficient I'm going to be now, you know, and like making the sacrifice of like trying to read Braille now, which I'm super slow at. But like, if I, if I make the investment now, then in 10 years, I'll be in much better shape. I'm glad you mentioned Colorado School for the Blind because that also uh, was on my list of things to talk about. And again, and co- correct me, that was primarily for researching, but also personal development. So talk about that experience. And do you think at some point you will go back? Because you were there for, I think, two weeks. Yeah. Um, and yeah. usually people are there for several months at a time. Nine so. months. Yeah. So it was very different experience. Um, mm-hmm. And then I was, I the New Yorker published an excerpt of my book, but like, I didn't realize this going into it, but it's like an excerpt that they got to like push me on in a lot of different directions, including sending me back to the Colorado Center for another two weeks. So okay. I actually went back for that. So I, I, I spent okay. a total of a month there, um, mm-hmm. but it was very different than the normal student experience in terms of how long I was there. And also I kind of got to tailor it to like, especially for the second trip. Like I knew that O&M was like what I wanted to write more about. And I wanted to do like some version of the final test, even though I hadn't been there for that long. So I basically got to spend like two weeks just doing travel class all day, which is very unusual. Like most students are never, and also just, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Cause like <laughs> if anybody who's done O&M under sleep shades, like it is a big cognitive drain. And I just, I would come back from those days of just like doing all day travel. Like my brain was leaking out of my ears. Wow. Um, but it you know it was an incredible privilege to be able to get that like short immersive colorado mm-hmm. center experience you know and, and when i remember when i was there i was talking to my friend will butler who i write about a lot in the mm-hmm. book and he never has gone to one of those places um but he was like kind of jealous and he was like there should be like a month long or a two week program for guys like us where he he works at apple in their accessibility uh-huh um marketing division and like so he can't just like take nine months off of work and do it um and you know when you're there it's like you're not you don't have time to do anything other than be a student at those places uh it's like it's eight to four every day and then like Mm -hmm. you know you're wiped so yeah it would be interesting to have that opportunity for people who can't go for nine months but your question about going back honestly like i can 
teach myself Braille and make myself mm-hmm. read Braille. I can like, I'm a pretty technologically oriented guy. Like I can read message boards and like figure out weird quirks of JAWS or, you know, Windows or whatever. The thing that, and even the kitchen, like I can sort of like take risks and do stuff. The thing that there is no substitute for is that travel class there. I mean, the O&M mm-hmm. instructors there are just like such badasses. And mm. uh, like, I can't, you know, and I, cause I'm, frankly, I'm not going to like put on sleep shades and just be like, I'm going to head to Springfield by myself today. Like it's just, <laughs> that's like a level of self motivation <laughs> that I don't have. So if anything, I think I would like wish, find a way to just like go and really immerse myself in O&M, but I don't know how that would happen. This is not just your journey. This is, your wife's journey with you, mm-hmm. your son's journey mm-hmm. with you. One, first of all, the the ending was just oh, dotting my eyes, oh. you know, like getting a little watery. Um, it was a Thank beautiful you, ending. But the um, I, I it, this is what I noticed. So early in, um, you're using the white cane. Yeah, you talk about being out with your wife, mm-hmm. and you wanted to. I think you wanted to use the restroom. Yeah, and, the restaurant. Right. And you were going to put out, uh, take out your cane. And she says, I don't think you need to. Yeah. But then later you talk about someone is reading a poem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's a little offensive. Yeah. Um, talk about that. Yeah. I thought what a, what a transition mm. for her. Mm-hmm. Um Am, am I am I over reading into that? No, you I, nailed it. I definitely saw a change there. No, you you absolutely picked up on that. Um, you know, that night that I pulled the cane out, you know, I had that was that was back when I had a collapsible cane and I carried it around in my bag and I never brought it out uh, unless I was like alone and it was at a bar and I was like, if I don't, I'm gonna like knock a beer into somebody's lap, which I did. Uh, <laughs> in the past. So I was like, I don't want to do that again and like get my butt kicked by some stranger. Yeah, so like, yeah. you know, but like at that point I was starting to get to the feeling of like, I think I need this more than just those times of like being afraid of knocking a beer over. Like, I think it might help me in other situations, but I hadn't really, I hadn't talked to Lily about it. And, right. and Lily I is your wife. Lily is my wife. And, and I hadn't really even really like thought it through myself. It was like this thing that was like, I was pushing it away in my mind. You know, there's this denial right. is is the right. word for it. Um, and, you know, I think part of my personality is a little bit of just like jumping out of the plane. You know, it's like, well, the only way this is going to happen is if I just go, you know, and so yeah. I think it was kind of an impulsive thing where I was like, all right, like, this is a dark restaurant. I don't know where the bathroom is. Like, this is a situation where I think maybe it would be good. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to do it. And the thing that I had no appreciation for at the time was like, the kind of the unfairness to Lily about that, like to expect her to be like, oh, okay, he's using the cane because he's having trouble in low light. And, you know, like none of that was on the table. She was just like, what the heck? Like, you know, and, and, and as anybody who has like seen a loved one using a cane for the first time, it is jarring because you're like, yeah. oh, wait, what? You're so vulnerable. You're like yeah. suddenly marked as like a totally blind person, but I know you're not totally blind. And like all of that soup of misunderstanding just kind of like, I like dumped it on her head at this restaurant mm-hmm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. Right. And, but then like, I didn't really have any appreciation for that. And so then I just kind of got righteous and I was like, you know, you're, you're reacting badly. And it took, you know, mm-hmm. there are years in between that scene and yes. the scene where, uh, that you're talking about at the synagogue where, um, somebody from the the synagogue reads this poem. The title is "Fall to Your Knees and Thank God for Your Eyesight," and that's oh like a gosh. refrain where they just say it over and over again. And it just my mom was there. It's funny because like we're actually going back to the Rosh Hashanah services, and like we were all joking, like I hope they don't read any poems this year. Uh, but my mom's like downstairs right now. We're gonna go um, uh, this week. But but yeah, then Lily like took it upon herself to write to the rabbi. And she was like, you know, there are a lot better poems about gratitude out there. Uh, Mm -hmm. And like, maybe you could pick a less ableist one next time. And I just, I was so Mm -hmm. moved by it because it was like, not only like that, she's like my attack dog. Like I didn't need her to write that email. (laughs) It was more like, because I felt like she wrote it out of a sense of like being hurt herself by it, you know? And like that she had internalized some of the experience that I was going through. And, and that felt really profound to me because it, it did, I yeah. think you're so that's such a thoughtful question because it does illuminate the way that she mm-hmm. had put herself into my shoes and then sort of appreciated what I was going through. Yeah. 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 Her growth in, into it with you and talk about Oscar. How well, is the, he doing? I mean, the cool thing about him and I feel like he's like 
there's like a 10% chance he's like standing outside my door right now <laughs> listening to this. I have to choose my words. But uh, uh, I mean, the, the really interesting thing about thinking about loved ones or family adapting to blindness with a, you know, sighted loved ones adapting to blindness is that like kids, uh, like for him, it's so much more normal than it is even for me. Cause like for me, I'm like, Oh, I grew up this way and I do things this way. Now I have to learn these things for him. It's just like, this is how my dad is and how he's always mm -hmm. been in his memory. You know, he's 10 years old and it's not weird at all for him. I don't think, I mean, you know, there are certainly times when sure, like we're out and he sees somebody say something weird to me, or he sees me get upset about something. And like, he's aware of those dynamics, but even that is just like part of this experience that he, that is normal for him. And that is, is incredibly useful and like moving and powerful for me. Cause it's like, I see it reflected in him as a thing that can be totally natural. And, mm -hmm. and, and in some ways, like of everybody in my life, it's the most natural for him. And, and that is really moving to me. In the book, you talk about reading in braille to him and he picked a book and it turns out it was <laughs> one that he read yeah uh before that before you started to read that book did you read to him other oh yeah books that he had okay all the and time you, were you able to see them to read them then you were able well, to. well it's really yeah i mean it's in like it was really like the pandemic was this experience of um you know because like suddenly he was home you know 400 percent more and so there was a lot more reading going on and that was a time that my vision was changing and like particularly i was noticing it around reading print because like before that like when i was teaching that class that i mentioned like i didn't have assistive tech at all i was just like reading books it's kind of wild to imagine that that was only like like five or six years ago um you know and i still can like 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 a letter comes here and if it's addressed to me like i can figure out that it's addressed to me but like it's a pain in the butt and like i just don't i don't want to you know um and so like during the period of the pandemic when suddenly like he was like let's read for the next three hours you know he's because he's just like a, that's his mind too he just like loves to hear stories um and I, that's when i was really running up against my limitations and i was like oh i can't um so then i bought a magnifier for a bazillion dollars and mm -hmm. i did it that way a lot but even that like i started to get fatigued and um you know so that 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 we're still in that kind of transitional period you know now he's 10 and he's yeah. reading he's reading on his own a lot more anyway but I'm still figuring that out, but Braille, reading aloud from Braille, it's a it's a rough rough time for me. I'm very <laughs> mm -hmm. very halting. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. I used to read to the kids uh, when they were little, and the nice thing was we read so many of the same books over and over. I didn't have to see the words. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I knew I could right, turn. I, in fact, I think I could still. I think I could still do uh, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, and Good Night <laughs> Moon, and uh, yeah. you know my kids are in their twenties, so okay, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, and it's also interesting, like a lot of those picture books, they basically are like sort of inadvertently large print books for low vision people anyway, you know, like <laughs> the fight, the font is that like 72 point font that you were talking about. <laughs> right. Andrew, when it comes to, we were talking earlier about where well, you mentioned being um, cognizant of intersectionality yeah, and um, in the blindness movement, there was a period where um, the organization, NFB in particular, really didn't want to get into the weeds of all of those other things. You mm -hmm. know, blindness was our, um, blindness is what held us together. Yes. Blindness is where we, you kind of be a united front. Mm -hmm. um, but what's your philosophy now on mm. that? And mm. and how do, you, how do you broach those you know, because there there was even a, another, a, again, another sort of history about the NFB that I wasn't aware of when the New York uh, chapter mm. was being started and the leader there was marching, I think, with other mm -hmm. disability community um, communities. And NFB wasn't too happy with that. How do you fight for both, you know, being for for me, for instance, being black and you know visually impaired, being yeah, a woman yeah. and black and visually impaired, yeah. like what do you what do you think is the best way to approach that uh, to to approach intersectionality? That is a really good and extremely difficult question. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the, the biggest surprises for me in writing the book and researching it was was that kind of divide that I found between like the civil rights model of yeah. disability activism and the disability justice model, which is much more intersectional, you know, and, and just like un unpack that a little bit. Um, you know, the NFB is 
as far as you can be. I mean, at least the NFB historically has been as far as you can be in the civil rights model, which is what you're talking about, where like Mm -hmm. Mark Marr is saying like, I don't want an LGBTQ meetup because we're about blindness. You know, and even in 2018, my first NFB convention, the, the, the banquet speech that President Riccobono gave was like, you know, um, uh, an NFB or who uh, has, I've learned a lot from Deborah Kent Stein told me like, this is new stuff for the NFB because the banquet speech was all about like the role of women in the movement. And yet like his conclusion was like, but the fact that they were women is not as important as the fact that they were blind people, like fighting for the rights of blind people. And that, so you're yeah. right to point out that that's sort of like, that has been the NFB's approach. And, um, and, you know, I think that there are, uh, NFBers of color who have certainly experienced that um, yeah. kind of that that as well. And you know, I talked to Anil Lewis a little bit about this, and you know, and he wrote a really interesting Braille Monitor piece um, that was sort of like very self-critical, or at least like self-searching, where he was sort of talking about how he had been so f- sort of fixated on that part of the NFB mission that like mm-hmm. it kind of like pulled him away from Black Lives Matter a little bit, and it took mm-hmm. George Floyd's murder and the sort of that movement that grew out of that um tragedy to kind of reorient him a little bit in terms of like yeah like how i <laughs> i mean yeah i don't know how to answer the question about like you know how to how to deal with that you know because cuz so then just to finish the the story like you know so i i i kind of encountered all of these ideas in the nfb and then i encountered the disability justice movement which is really it's it's much more recent you know it's coming out of like i think the early 2000s the bay area mm-hmm. and it's and it's a lot of uh, disabled uh, women of color, a lot of queer people, mm-hmm. and and you know their idea is basically like you know the image of disability has been like if you picture a disabled guy, like you know if I asked you in like nineteen, not you necessarily, but whoever, like if you ask somebody like the person on the street, like you know what, draw a picture of a disabled person for me, you know like who right. who do you picture? And like their argument is it's like a fit white dude in a wheelchair, you know, in with like yeah, mm-hmm. um, with no other disabilities and. And, um, and so disability justice movement is much more about like recentering, uh, uh, you know, the people who are left out for, of that image and not only that, but it's, but it's also like, you know, NFB and then the sort of civil rights model, which includes like the black civil rights movement, you know, it's very mm-hmm. fixed parts of it, you know, components of it are very focused on policy change and, you know, working within government to change laws, to make society and, 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 and the law more, more just. And disability justice is is like a you know as the name suggests it's like a social social justice movement that is much more like abolitionist almost you know so in the same way that like Black Lives Matter are talking about Black Black Lives Matter activists are talking about police abolition you know you see disability justice folks saying things like you know I don't want more disability benefits what I want is to like build networks of care uh, of disabled people like taking care of each other outside of these like systems of capitalist oppression that are that are basically marginalizing us no matter what. And so it's it's like in some ways like almost hard to square like a sort of NFB civil rights model with this like mm-hmm. radical abolitionist disability justice model that doesn't want really yeah. any there's not even really any place for like a sort of civil rights approach. So yeah, my brain hurts trying to like think of like how to <laughs> how to square those two. And I think, I mean, I think the path forward for the NFB, I, I don't know, I can't speak for disability justice movement, but, you know, like when I went to the NFB online uh, Zoom convention, and I, th- I think it was the 2021, there was a, a, a speaker named Justice Shorter, who is not an NFB member. Uh, she's blind, uh, and she's black, and she's like deep in the disability justice movement. And the way she was talking about it, I found really powerful, where she was kind of like, like, basically encouraging anybody, no matter who they are, or what their identity is, to sort of think intersectionally about disability mm-hmm. justice. And to, you know, it's important to advocate for for blind people, but also to think about people with multiple disabilities, people, um, you know, who have experienced oppression or marginalization from other identities. And I think there is room for, for both of those. And like, the last thing I'll say about it is like, there's this term that I learned recently that I found out was actually from like when blind people first were getting mainstreamed into public schools, and the idea is like the the vanilla blind person, and they use this this mm. term to to reference basically like kids with with who only had blindness and no other disabilities, because like in, in the schools there would be like kids with multiple disabilities in addition to blindness, right. and it was like, but 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 the but the idea of vanilla blindness I think gets back to that like white guy in the wheelchair of like 
when you talk about a blind person, like who are you picturing? And like, what, what is that? You know, I think that's something that the NFB has struggled with, like in particular in the training centers where it's like, we can help a blind person. Well, like, what about a blind person with multiple disabilities? Or like, what about a blind Mm -hmm. person who is experiencing oppression in all these other ways? And like, Mm -hmm. I think there is this very vanilla blind attitude that can come up in a lot of these spaces where it's like, this person, all they have to deal with is blindness. They're middle class. They're white. You know, they're they're mm-hmm. not trans. They're cisgendered. You know, they're mm-hmm. they're heterosexual. And so, like, it's much easier to kind of like compartmentalize blindness in that kind of situation. But you do so at the expense of leaving a tremendous number of people behind. Well, I think you tackled that. <laughs> all right. Well, I, mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Because it's it's not an easy answer. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. The only other thing that I would ask you you talk about it at different times in your book about almost feeling like a fraud because you can see and yeah. people around you saying, hey, that guy can see, why is he using a cane? I, I know a lot of us have uh, yeah. come up against that. Oh, that guy can see. He's not blind. He's not blind. And it's always yeah. that offer on type of thing. Yes. And you mentioned that a, a few times. Has there been some issues where you've run into some sighted folks when you're out and about and you do that and you're you're moving around and somebody says, what do you need that for? Because you clearly can see. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's a scene in the book where it just haunts me to this day where I was really at kind of like the peak of that feeling of fraudulence and mm-hmm. I was in a hurry. And, you know, back then the cane still felt like an affectation, but it wasn't a hurry. It was really useful because I was just like moving more quickly and I just caught this guy's eye and I could tell that he was like looking at me skeptically. And I kind of looked away. And then as I passed by him, he was like, you can see. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and I was like, and I just like, the only thing I could think to say to him was like, actually I can, you know, and I sounded like such a dweeb. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, like, it just, that just stuck with me. Cause I felt like I'd seen that on so many people's faces. And then just to yeah. hear him say it was like, it yeah. kind of, it was like picking a scab, like it felt good. And it felt really bad at the same time. Um, you know, this is one thing that I think the NFB has given me that is so powerful is the way the NFB defines blindness, which is, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with um, like a legal definition. It's like, if you rely on assistive technology, like if you need Mm -hmm. to do alternative techniques to get through your day, whether it's a white cane or a screen Mm -hmm. reader or magnifiers, um, then you're blind. And I I was asking this question of Brian Bashan, who's sort of a mentor for me, who's been in the NFB for a long time uh, and also ran the San Francisco lighthouse. And he was telling me a story about somebody who had the same sort of anxiety I did about like, am I blind enough to like be in the club? You know, right. and they were like, <laughs> and I think they, they was talking to somebody who didn't, I don't think they used a white cane, but they they still had, you know, they still were blind. And, um, and he was like, you know, when you hold up that magnifying glass, you know, to like see mm-hmm. the things in your life, like that's your cane, like the, the little arm yeah. on your magnifying glass can be your cane. Yeah. And, uh, so these days, even though I still like see people look at me that way, or sometimes like like when a blind person asks me how I read my audiobook, I'm just like apologizing, you know. But like for the most part, I've gotten a lot more comfortable thinking of myself as a blind person because for that reason, I'm like, look at me, I'm like running jaws all day. I mm-hmm. own like four canes. I carry around <laughs> spare tips in my pocket. Like, how am I not blind? You're in. <laughs> You're in. <laughs> yeah. How about going the other way? Have you ever had feedback or? Uh, criticisms from those who are maybe totally blind or have been blind mm. for a lot longer? Have you ever mm. gotten pushback on that end? Like, just tell me that, like, you're not one of us. Right. Mm. Like, you're not one of us or you don't know because you haven't been blind long enough or yeah. something like that. Uh, You know, I've gotten, like, good nature. Like, there's a guy, Chris Snyder, who I met at an audio oh, yeah. description shop in L.A. Mm-hmm. And when he was, uh, his boss, Rick Boggs, introduced mm-hmm. me as, like, Andrew's, like, you know, a cane user, but he still has vision. And then Chris was like, oh, so you're almost one of us. And, but he said it like with a smile. And I was like, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. I didn't mind that. Um, yeah. You know, the thing that I think I get sometimes, it was interesting. I don't want to call these guys out, but I will anyway. I'm not calling them <laughs> out, but just like, I'll tell the story. So I was on a podcast that I will not name, uh, but okay. you will totally know exactly what I'm talking about based on how I'm saying it. Um, it's a sighted woman and her blind husband. And like, <laughs> uh popular blindness podcast and in the beginning i would like we were setting up on zoom and like their first question and this is in the episode but she's like you know andrew like you wrote this book about blindness but like i can see you sort of like looking around the screen at like zoom and like how, she was almost like she was calling me out and i don't think she meant yeah. to i think she was just like wanting to ask the question that you asked in a less obnoxious way 
But, you know, it like really threw me back on myself where I was like, I feel like I had to defend myself and be like, well, you know, like, why do you say that? Uh, like, I can look around. Yeah, I, like I saw the Zoom box, but like I also am running Jaws, whatever. And and then I kind of tried to push it back on her. And and the place she was coming from was she was like, well, when my husband lost, you know, he was like low vision for a long time. And then when he lost his like useful vision, it was like a game changer for him. And it was like so much harder. Mm -hmm. And I think like the trauma of that experience for her and and for him, you know, by extension, uh, like, like had made her a little almost protective of that experience of like total mm -hmm. blindness versus being low vision. And, you know, I want to respect that. I respect it way more if he was the one saying it than she was, but, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that, that it keeps me honest, I think to like, not be like, well, I've like cracked the blindness thing, like with my five, six degrees of, of central vision, you know, like, and I have to respect that. Like it is a very different experience having you yeah. know, zero, zero degrees than it is having five. Right. I noticed that in, at the NFB convention this year in Houston, mm. um, while I have a great difficulty seeing, I was the sighted one with all the blind friends, mm. uh, like Lisa mentioned earlier. And a lot of people seem to think that I could see way more than I actually could see. Mm. And I, I would go back to my hotel room at night and think, why do they think that? Mm. Because I, you know, I'm still using my cane. I'm still feeling around and I, I you talk about going to the bathroom. You, the worst place to feel for anything is in a bathroom, <laughs> especially a, a bathroom where there's 2,500 blind people staying at. Right. And <laughs> it's just interesting about that. The hierarchy of sight is is a real thing, you know? Um, yeah. And I think, I mean, that's another thing that I'll give NFB props for is, is really pushing back against that. I mean, I think that's where you get that definition of blindness to say, like, we're all blind. I don't care if you have sight or, you know, some sight or no sight. And there's a really, I, I kind of want to revisit it, but there's a really great uh, recording that's online called the dishwasher tape. Have you guys ever heard this? Mm -mm, it's no, no. it's Kenneth Jernigan, who is the president of the NFB in mm -hmm. like the sixties was sort of his heyday. Well, he, I think he was president for a couple of decades. Um, yeah. And it's him like at the Iowa uh, blindness center that he ran. And he's like giving a, like a sort of a pep talk to his students. And, and he talks about like not having your cake and eating it too. And, and like, basically like, I think what happened was like, all the, like the low vision students were sort of like busting the dishes and like the totally blind students. It was like, there was basically like this, this site hierarchy thing that came out. I can't remember the details mm -hmm. of it, but he really like called them all out and was like, you know, you can't, you we can't let this hierarchy of sight exist among us. Like you have to, we all have to sort of be equal as blind people mm -hmm. and like carry our weight. And, you know, it's it definitely is dated in that way of like, you know, the sort of like tough love, like that mm -hmm. you find it at places like the Colorado center. But I also find it really empowering to like, not think about not hold myself above anybody else because I have more sight or hold myself below anybody else. Cause I have less sight and, right. and to just sort of like accept what I've got and use it and think of myself as, you know, a, a, a colleague and an equal of, of everyone. Before we let you go, Andrew, tell us what's next. If you, if you can with yeah. about uh, revealing too many trade secrets. Oh yeah. I don't have secrets. It's more, I'm just like figuring it out. Um, but I do, like I said, I, I'm really excited to be writing about disability and and pushing beyond blindness. So one thing I'm thinking a lot about, like in the book, I have a whole chapter about technology and like the ways that a lot of technologies that were developed with blind people and for blind people ended up becoming like world transforming things that everybody uses from like the LP and audiobooks to like flatbed scanners and really mm -hmm. like the, the internet and um so much more and that dynamic is really interesting to me and i'm kind of interested in like media and disability mm -hmm. and um like the ways that disability changes how people communicate and think about access like information like basically the way disabled people access information and like what how that has changed the world i keep saying one sighted folks hear something with audio description mm. and they think, Hey, I could get in my car and drive somewhere and listen to a movie. Yeah. It's going to, that will also become mainstream because it's, I, I could see something on Sirius XM where there's a movie channel or uh, a TV channel that has the audio description that they just play uh, shows, you know, in movies all day. And uh, I, I think that's, on its way i probably not yet until more things get described but yeah uh, i i really thought that when i listened to that part of the book 
Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, at every sports bar in the country at this moment has closed captions on the ball game, right? While they blast ACDC over it. And right. <laughs> That's it's the right. same, the same. Well, yeah. Why not audio description, you know, by, by the same token. So the book is available how and where? Uh, so sadly, it's still not on Bard, but um, it is on Bookshare. And okay. um, and it's also available wherever fine books are sold, whether it's your local indie bookstore. There's a large print edition. Shout out to large print readers out there. Oh, nice. Um, and uh, also, you know, on Audible or Libro FM, you can get the audio book, which I read, as you mentioned. And uh, yeah, that's basically a Kindle store for the ebook. Okay. Is there a Braille version of it? I don't think so. No. I mean, I, okay. my sense is that like most Braille readers these days are 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 reading at least like that's I shouldn't say that because I'm sure we'll get like angry emails from Braille readers. Like, <laughs> I still read hard copy, but I do think so. Like, we'll get them probably, not yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But the refreshable Braille displays, I feel like, have given hard copy Braille a run for its money, especially with a book like this. It's just like so expensive to print uh, the handful of copies yeah, that aren't really circulating right. anyway. So you know, that's on right. Bookshare, you can download a Braille ready format. And how do people follow you, Andrew? As you as your journey continues and you continue to do great exploits. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have an email newsletter that I try to be pretty sparing about, like not to spam people. But mm -hmm. uh, if you go to my website, andrewleland.org, uh, there's a link to my email newsletter. Or you can follow me on social media. Uh, good luck finding me on Mastodon, but uh, <laughs> I haven't quite figured that one out yet, but I'm on there somewhere and, you know, X and Facebook and whatever else, Instagram. Well, again, congratulations. Well done. Um, kudos, all of that. I, I, both David and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So it's a tremendous story. And like I said, it's more than just, uh, as you said, you know, here I was born here and, you know, yeah. uh, this, this is what I've done with my life so far. There's so much great history there. There's education there. It's chock full. So fine job. And oh, man. Hope Thank you so much. It was yeah, so fun to I, talk to you both. These are such great questions you guys asked. I really am grateful for it. Oh, thank you. And I, I'm so glad we connected. It's It's been our delight. I love the name of the podcast. It just really like, it makes me feel like our white canes, just like, you know, I can hear the sound <laughs> effect. And I was like, ka-ching! <laughs> Maybe we have, have to get a ka-ching in the I know, like, you're listening a, to... Some sort of clacking sound. Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right. David's on it. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. That's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again to Andrew for stopping by and telling us about his book. And again, Lisa, what a lot of great information in the book, both, as you said earlier, with the history of the NFB and the ACB, as well as some tech things, everything about it. It's just a very good read, especially for folks if you're not blind. It gives a good insight on how blind people operate. And one of the things that I try to talk about in my own podcast, how blind folks maneuver through their their day and their world and andrew's book kind of really gets into it it really does i i i can't say enough how much i learned um about our organization and folks will be it's it's really sort of a who's who <laughs> in the nfb there are lots of names there that folks uh, and and it doesn't even matter how long you've been in the federation you will recognize some of these names i think he does a fantastic job of not being too uh teachy in that and he does definitely takes the high road and just sort of presenting where our organization was on some issues and not necessarily bashing anyone um i think he takes a very just a very impartial view but i love how even with that he's able to be very personable and he talks very candidly about what uh, his vision loss has done to his his marriage, what it's done to him as a man, as a father. Um, so it's it's very it's very much a good combination of very personal, but also he takes that impartial approach to telling the history of our organization. Yeah, he really does. And some of the things. Obviously, you're never going to agree with someone or an organization 100%. One of the things that he also talked about here in the interview was the 
adding all of the disabled folks together in one lump. I'd rather have, you know, how do you get that big task done? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And if you have yeah. everything together, you know, look, there's closed caption on everything, mm -hmm. but there's not audio description on everything. Let's just go down a checkbox and let's say audio description. Once you check that off, then move to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, that is a better approach because then you can get it done and you can get more people on board with one item than with a basket of items, I think. So the book was released in July, as David said earlier, it's on Audible, it's on uh, Amazon, wherever fine books are sold, as they say, uh, you can download it through Bookshare. Yeah, and uh, and I, I have the copy, I have it on Bookshare, but like I said in the intro, I had some issues with it, so I downloaded it on the audio version, and I really, like I said, I really did enjoy the audio version of it listening to him read it and and getting and talking to him and getting the behind the scenes of how he did it uh was was a great insight because i thought that the whole time i'm listening to him read the book and uh, and, and again it's just his you can hear by his voice he's got a great voice mm -hmm. and he just reads the book and you kind of get the really get the insight with him reading it so check it out and if you do Report back to us. Um, in fact, if there's anything in this episode that sort of jarred your memory, if you've been in the Federation back when, the, you know, there was the sort of civil war <laughs> um, and have some thoughts that you want to share, uh, we're, we're, we'd, we'd love to hear that. We will have links to the book on Amazon in the show notes and some of the other books that he mentioned, because he did talk about a couple of other things. Uh, we will link to them in the show notes so you can take a look there as well as his contact info and his website and things like that. I want that link to the font that he mentioned. Yes. And the font that's, I'm excited to try that mm -hmm. font because as I said, we're increasing almost daily. It seems we'd love to hear from you. Um, tell us what you think about Anything that was discussed today, uh, what do you think about audio description and what do you think about our organization's initial position on that? Just share your thoughts with us. Um, email address is whitecanesconnect at gmail.com. You can also reach out via phone 267-338-4495. You've got up to three minutes to leave your message. Please leave your name and your town if you do leave a voicemail. We will probably use it on an upcoming episode. Again, as long as you don't go crazy with the swear words, we're good to go. Please reach out, 267-338-4495. Lisa, I really enjoyed this episode. So did I, David. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.